Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. In a world where everyone says hello, they dare to say, Yeah, yeah good day. Yeah, good day. Yeah, good day. Yeah, good day. Yeah, good day. Yes. Good day. Yeah. Good day. Yeah. Good day. Yeah. Good day. Yeah, good day. Wow, wow. Yeah, yeah good day. Hey, yeah. yeah, good day. Yeah, good day, Tim. Yeah, good day, Leon. Tim, I yes, feel Leon. like there's another presence in the room with us right now. There's definitely another presence. It's a human being. He's sitting directly across from us. It's very observant of you. Ah, that would be it. Tim, today we are extremely lucky. Uh, we've been joined by Robert Drew, a renowned international Australian author, um, who has just written a new book called Whip Bird, which we have read. We have, luckily enough. We, we did read the book prior <laughs> to meeting with uh, Rob today, and uh, we've read Our Sunshine as well, which is another fantastic book. Won't be talking about that book specifically today, but uh, Rob's work is fantastic, and we've got him here. How are you doing, Rob? I'm pretty good, thank you. That's good to hear. I think, uh, Rob, first of all, we just want to say thank you for travelling because, as you just said, you've been uh, tra- travelling around today. You've come just straight from Ballarat to here, um, which is a bit of an effort. So thanks for turning up. No, it's a pleasure. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, as we mentioned, uh, you've just written your new book, Whitbird. I guess you didn't just write it, but it, it's out now and um, we mm-hmm. had a read. i got to say, straight off the bat before we ask any questions about it, I absolutely loved it. Oh, great. Um Good. In terms of the way it captures, we were talking about this like all of last night, preparing to, to meet you today and talk to you today. The way it captures so many different aspects of Australian life and so many interesting characters and viewpoints, um, yeah, I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I feel the exact same way. I, I As Tim mentioned, I read um, Our Sunshine a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when we got the email from and yes, I kind of went, I feel like I know this name, and then I read that you read it, and I went, "Oh man, this is so exciting!" So, yeah, I was I already loved that kind of stuff, and then Whitbird was, you know, just excellent. Such a yeah. great. Yeah, book. I appreciate that. Thank you. No oh, worries. All right, well, let's launch into some questions about the book, I guess. So, um, to not give too much away to our to our audiences because we want them to read it, um, it's definitely worth a read. Uh, the basic premise of the book is it's a family reunion of sorts, um, about 160 years after the original uh, ancestor. Yep. Um, Connor comes over as part of the British infantry with the Eureka Stockade. Um, yep. That would that, be correct? Yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah, it, It's um, actually based on um, an ancestor of mine, my great-grandfather, who was a teenage uh, Irish boy um, starving during the potato famine. And for the Queen's shilling, he joined the British Army uh, and it, it was the 40th Regiment of Foot and was sent out here um, to fight the Eureka Stockade on the wrong side. Right. Yeah, right, and so I took that as a, my sort of starting point, mm. and I thought, what would it be like? Um, he, in, he, in fact, uh, had fifteen kids, twelve of whom survived. Wow. Um, and I thought, what would it be like if all his descendants uh, held a big party to celebrate their their arrival? And if you do the maths, if they were having fifteen kids, a couple in those days, quite a lot of people would come to the party. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I, I, especially if Grog was involved. Well, that's the thing. <laughs> get, get a bit of alcohol there, and it's the winery. I, I think that's. Um, I think what's really exciting about the book is the amount of characters that you've got in there. But what makes the book even more interesting is that uh, you you write in the in the first person all the time, majority of the time, um, and and you get into all these different characters from different sides of the family, whether it's male, female, like kids, teenagers, people. The you know that you get into the mind of the ancestor at, at points in time as well. Yep. So I, I guess my kind of first question when it comes to that is. How do you do it? How do you do those characters so well? Because you do it amazingly. It's seamless. It, it doesn't seem like Robert Drew writing as a fifteen-year-old girl, sixteen-year-old girl. It seems like right. Uh, well, I do. Have, I have a seventeen-year-old daughter, so the dialogue, <laughs> the dialogue that came from that, um, is reasonably accurate. Yeah. Um, what I what I was considering while I was writing it was the host is a um, a Melbourne barrister, mm. a rather stuffy Melbourne barrister. He's just missed out on getting out on getting a QC at Queen's Council, so he's he's a little bit bitter. It wasn't how he how he planned the party, but he's moving from group to group, filling up people's glasses and so forth with wine, 
And I like to think that um, as he approached each group of quite different people, they would have a viewpoint or they'd be discussing something as he came up to them. And so I wanted, I wanted each group to be, um, to be sort of represented in a way. Mm. And if you think of a, a suburban barbecue, any given suburban barbecue on a Sunday afternoon in, in Australia, anywhere in Australia, sooner or later as the wine flowed or the beer flowed, uh, various topics would come up. Mm. And very, uh, you know, we're talking about today, contemporary topics would come up. One of them would be uh, climate change. One of them would probably be uh, the, the matter of Muslims. Uh, you can, you can, one of them would be um, the, you know, the plebiscite um, on, on, on marriage. Mm. Um, so I wanted these people to be talking about these current topics and to, to voice the sort of opinions that uh, not ones that you would necessarily agree with, but w- w- would come up at any given party. Yeah, I think that was actually... That was definitely one of my favourite things that I thought you did incredibly well. As you mentioned, every, all of these different characters, they do talk about these kind of more contemporary situations that we're going through in Australia now, and they voice them from their own... Sometimes it, it seems kind of generational in the way that they kind of get yep. expressed. Yeah. Um, so I was that was something that really impressed me, not only the specifics of the characters themselves, but the way that you blended so seamlessly from generation to generation Um, because I could see people I know reflected in, you know, in the way Mick spoke and and things like that. Exactly. Um, Well, he's sort of everyone's grandfather, isn't he? Oh, absolutely. Um, And that that kind of divide he has where, yeah, he's got Rani who's entered the family and kind of opened his mind a little bit, but there's still that. Yeah, he's he's trying. His intentions are good. Yeah, absolutely. Which is the whole point, really, isn't it? Mm, absolutely, yeah. yeah. But I think that's, I think uh, what's kind of interesting, and I think, so as you said, sometimes the opinions aren't, um, aren't what people would see as, I guess, favourable, but it's accurate, and that's what's so good about it. And um, I, I don't know, but we recently talked with um, John Safran about his book, Depends What You Mean by Extremist, mm. um, and we're looking again at the views of, as you say, kind of what's happening to the Muslim Australians, what's happening in that world. And rather than, I guess, paint the, the picture of documentarian, you're painting the picture of what happens with a couple of glasses of wine, what actually is said, what's really said, mm-hmm. um, which was amazing. But uh, I guess a really big question that I want to ask early on, because I think it's an important one, is you do touch on the, the topic of cultural cringe, yep. um, which I I believe is, is huge in Australia. I think yes, we're the, so like, the I. only... I reckon we're the only nation that really has it. Americans love when they see Americans on TV, but we hate it. Um, do you, like, why do you think that is? I think, I don't know. It drives, it drives me crazy. It drives me crazy on several levels. It drives me crazy that at any given literary festival, say, um, an American or an English uh, writer with one book under their belt will take precedence over an Australian writer with 12. Mm-hmm. Um, they are somehow seen as, as better than us, and it, dri- it drives me bloody mad. Um, yeah. It's um, it's just a colonial mentality, and I wh- wh- I, I use that where, where I've got the the um, the jaded um, skeleton of a man who's a former rock and roller. Yeah, I mean rock rock groups do, do that all the time when they go overseas or when they when they used to. They would have to behave. They would be, feel self conscious, so mm. they'd have to behave extra badly. They'd have to be hyper super yeah. bands to actually they thought to get across. But all that did was make them embarrassed and embarrassing, really. Yeah, mm. absolutely. <clears throat> and kind of extending on that as well. Um, a conversation that I found interesting that you document in the book. Uh, is it Thea or Tia? We Thea. were arguing Thea. Oh, yeah. We were, yeah. I was I said, wrong. I said, was right. I said Thea. <laughs> um, she's having a conversation. She obviously works for uh, Medicines on Frontier. Yeah. Um, and she's having a conversation with a gentleman when she's in Sudan where he asks her to describe Australia. And I think this is connected to the, to the cultural cringe. And she finds it really difficult. And I 100% identify mm. with that. Mm. Is that, some, is yeah, that well, something? Well, so do I. Yeah. She, she was actually, I, I mean, I used her in a sense. Um, I liked her, her character very much. I liked, uh, she was very recognisable to me as a bossy person with good intentions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been yeah. very bossy, but well, with very good intentions. Um, but when she, when she sort of described what she thought of Australia, she said it sounds as if we're a boring form of Switzerland, really. Yeah, when uh, you when you put it down to the political, you know, facts of it all, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. and especially at the moment. And one reason why I wanted to write this book, and the the feeling I have is even has intensified more than it was in twenty fourteen when I when I was writing it, 
uh, is really what, well, you know, this is hardly news, what a mess the world seems to be in at the moment, mm. but also how Australia seems to be sort of upside down somehow, mm. where, where there's, there's, there's heaps of issues out there, but nothing, is, nothing is, is firmed and nothing happens with any of them. All that happens is they're put forward, muddied, and then forgotten. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, and that, I wanted, I wanted these people to be um, present at this party at, with that in that atmosphere. So they're all a little bit, they're all a little bit edgy, and they're and they're all um, and have conflicting ideas. But no one has any solutions or any answers any more than any, you know that anyone else does. No, and I, I think uh, what's interesting, um, I guess, uh, when when writing in the first person or reading in the first person, um, it. It has this weird thing because because we're so used to how a story goes when it's told to us in third person or in, in another kind of way, we're expecting you know a big event, a big bit of tension, something to drop at any point. So I found that reading Whitbird because of you know you know reading other books, I'm sitting there going something big's about to drop, something big's about to happen, and like it eventually does. There is big stuff, but because you're just it, because you're just painting such an accurate picture of a, of two days or, or two and a half days, or whatever it is, with an Australian family. It, I, I guess it could feel like something isn't happening, but there's so much behind it. Like, mm. it's a 300-page book. Like, mm. there's so much to say. Mm. Um, and, like, again, I, I, that's, I just find that so so interesting. And I think, again, with your characters, when you're writing them, for for every kind of, I guess, one sentence they speak, like for um, for Father Brian, when he's doing his big speech towards the end, for every one sentence that he has, there's like three or four pages of, of internal monologue of what he's thinking. Mm. Um, I guess I guess that's kind of a why question. Like, why do you do that? Why do you get into that mode? Well, because I want I want to bring um, veracity to the to the characters. I want mm. them to to for you to believe that they exist. Basically, it's as simple as that. Mm. And what I liked the idea was when there's people of different um, ages, classes, and genders and so forth wandering around, at the same time as um, uh, Doug and Mick are arguing about the banks, the banking system. Mm, mm. In one corner, there's Liam re- wanting to race the 17 year old boy, wanting to race off back into Melbourne um, on a, on what he hopes is a hot date. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, and he doesn't. He wouldn't give a stuff about the banking system or anything else. He's he's absolutely focused yeah. on getting into his car, getting away from the party of oldies, mm. and and going, you know, finding this girl. Mm. Absolutely. So I guess. The next kind of th- thing to talk about, because we've talked about obviously your connection to the Eureka Stockade and how that kind of idea f- flowed out. The next kind of interesting point of the book or or the idea is Connor's connection to being there in his own way mm. on this particular event, which is through Simon, mm. um, who has Cotard's disease. Cotard's disease, yeah. yeah, Cotard's syndrome. So my question is because it's an incredibly interesting disease an incredibly interesting concept that he is in a way sharing his consciousness with you know the yeah. the ancestor how did that specific circumstance kind of occur to you as as, as I was of, writing it yeah as you, as your method of I was thinking Connor? I was wondering about a way that I could I could introduce um, the original man uh, mm. Connor Cleary the 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 uh, the Irish immigrant um, into the party and um, I heard of this disease called, or this, this syndrome called Cotards, which is an extreme form of schizophrenia that can be hastened by a massive drug consumption and things over a life, mm. which seemed to me to be the life of um, a, a rock musician. Yep. And we know there's plenty of examples. You know, we don't have to look too far for, for that. Mm. But when I heard about the specific disease where people think that they're dead, uh, even though they're still living and breathing, they think their organs have atrophied and, um, and they no longer exist. And I looked that up and found found uh, a bit about it, and that seemed to me the perfect. He was a, a husk of a man, mm. um, and very able to absorb, in in a sense. I mean, um, the um, what he what he imagined, or I mean, or is it a ghost? Or I mean, you one one is led to wonder. Yeah, it's, um, it's kind of a nice uh, question. Uh, but but the presence of of the of the ancestor, um, and I lo- I just well I'm, I love that idea, and it, it for me it made. Um, it made it a bit. It made it easier. Um, it's interesting when you when you investigate Cotard syndrome. There was a, there's examples of there's only about uh, perhaps a dozen examples in medical literature, but there's one in England of a guy who um, he keeps turning up at funeral parlours and um, 
and morgues and things asking to be you know taken in right uh, you know give me a, give me a break yeah i'm dead but won't you do the right thing yeah, yeah. Wow. And, and that is so macabre that um i mean they're not scary they're not zombies or anything they're just they're just normal human beings who believe that they don't exist anymore yeah it's it, it, it it's 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 amazing like I, when i when i read it in the book i first thought that you might have invented it because i was like this sounds so out there i can't i couldn't i can't imagine it mm. but by the end of the book like i don't know i i i felt really you know in touch with mm. simon's character mm. it, it, well which i guess is at the same time connor's character but it's such a it's such an ingenious play between the two characters like you have the husk of a character that's present and you, then you have the 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 thoughts of someone from the past it's and each of them only really come to any sort of realization or or redemption uh, through the love of, um, in Simon's case, his daughter, mm. Mm. and um, in Connor's case, his, his you know long dead children and mm. long dead wives, really. And that so the, the essence of it, even when someone thinks they're dead, there's still a little spark of something, which is, I guess, love um, mm. that that makes them um, real again. Yeah, that's a really, it's a really nice thought, actually. <laughs> um, it the the another kind of big conversation that we had, and again it ties back into the Eureka Stockade thing and Australia in general. Um, it's almost like Australians romanticise things uh, to make up mm. for lost time, is what we were saying. So because we're a young nation, we make up for lost time. So with the Eureka Stockade, Connor's family are talking about how he came and he fought in the war and he was on the he was on the Australian side is what they're talking about. Yeah, it's I think Hugh even in his speech at the beginning of the mm. weekend specifically and he you write this that he makes that conscious effort to play up their military mm. exactly mm. service to Australia, yes. Yeah. But in reality like well, Connor, that's what yeah. interested me. I I like the idea of um an unheroic figure. Mm. Um uh, and this this part was actually based on my um my ancestor who we were always told um the Eureka Stockade boy, we were always told that he eventually he became the general in charge of um, Southern Command um, and ran um, Victoria Barracks in St Kilda Road, you know, that big, that big building there. And he was in charge of that. In fact, uh, when I looked into it, he was the, court, he was the quartermaster, as is the character, yep. in charge of rifle bolts and gaiters and, you know, potato rations and things. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, nothing's uh, too exciting. Uh, no, but I mean, in the Chinese whispers way of families, everything is always exaggerated in a sense, like, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but not only not only was he on the wrong side, but he didn't get very far. Yeah, and and that's like there's the whole play like you talk about the other wars that he fought in, like with the the Maori the Maori, yeah, the Maori wars, yeah. shotgun pellets in the butt and all that kind of thing. Like <coughs> it's it's just it, I, I don't think we can hammer it into our listeners enough because there are, there are, there are international listeners to the show that we're hoping are going to read the book, and I feel like that'd be a really interesting perspective to have coming from it from the outside. Mm. But for us coming from Australia, like it's just so accurate, it's so realistic. Yeah. Every story is so real we all know a hue we all know a, a thea we all know mm. like it's it's crazy yeah well as we mentioned we spoke to john Fa- saffron and about his book uh what uh depends what you mean, <laughs> depends by, what you mean by extremists mm. mine went blank for a second and i kind of said like this is a really interesting snapshot of australia right now i wouldn't necessarily say your book is a snapshot so much as a photo album yeah just mm. a, a really interesting set of snapshots from so many different points of view um, of Australia, and as we mentioned, you know, Thea talks about you know how do you how do you, you how do you describe Australia? I think your book does comes pretty. Oh, good. Well, thank pretty you. Pretty close to. to it. I did. I did actually consciously think I want to put Australia on the slab and dissect it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, it, without without that sounding too lectury or anything, because I don't. Um, I hold some of those opinions, but not all of them, and I can and I can and I can um, appreciate people who hold quite different ones to most ones that are different to mine. But there's a certain a certain uh, thing, a certain attitude that people like Hugh have where um, they can see a huge issue like global warming and think, well, actually, it's not so bad because it enables me to grow Pinot Noir grapes yeah. Yeah. where I couldn't before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's that sort of, um, oh, the world's stuffed, but I'm okay. Yeah. And that is a peculiarly Australian thing in a lot of cases too. Absolutely. Yeah, it's because we're, we're down the bottom. We always just go, America will sort itself out and England will sort yeah. itself out and we'll just get told what to do in the end is essentially what we... And suddenly we're in the Philippines I read today, which amazed me. I would have thought that was a strange little war to get involved in. Oh, are we? Yeah. Oh. What? Why? Well, we're, is we're helping. The we're helping that gun, gun, uh, happy president who um, who shoots yeah. who shoots drug dealers and things. Well, we're as you talk him. about in the book, we're always overseas in some war that yeah. 
has no relevance to us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A, uh, awesome. a very, a very particular part of the book that I took great enjoyment in is the discussion about. Um, I get I get lost. How do you remember characters? I get lost with your characters sometimes because there, there, there were so many. I'm just kind of it's sitting a large here going. Family. There's a large family. <laughs> Who was talking? Um, Hugh is the owner of the vineyard. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Hugh and his wife Christine. 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 Yes. Yeah. I love the conversation about how he, um, where Mick's talking about the fact that he went from being a boy that said H to a boy that says H. Because mm-hmm. I am obviously a, a, a boy and a man that says H, and I always have. Did you go to a Catholic school? I did go to a Catholic school. Yeah, there you go. But I, I, it was an argument that I've had many times before, but my argument is if it's if my last name is Huxtable, it's not Uxtable. So <laughs> it's an H. But I just thought that was such a, like, again, like, it, it's such a tiny moment, but to me I was like, Oh my God, Robert right, Drew is in my head. <laughs> He's thinking what I'm thinking. Like, yeah. Do you have? Do you have? What's your answer to that question? I guess H H or I, H? I say I say H, but what I went to, H? I went to a, a Protestant school. Oh. Um, but there were the, the Catholic members of the family um, say H. So, Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I, it was an, I think it was an Irish. It was an Irish um, habit. Okay. Um, I, and I don't. I don't have any uh, strong views. I don't have strong views about it like I do about. Apostrophes in, in the wrong place. That's sort of thing. <laughs> well, yeah, sure. That's just that's just common sense that yeah. no one has. So that was Leon's kind of little moment. I had two two moments. One of them's kind of extended over the period of the book, and I think I know why you why you went with that. The first one that I'll talk about is when you talk about Dancer Stedfords. Um, is it Mick that talks? Because. Yeah, no, M- yes. M- Mick is remembering when Thea was a, te- uh, a, a child. Mm. Yeah, and he used to take her to dance at Stedfords and yeah. things. Yeah. So my sisters used to dance, and me and my father would have to tour around to these regional like Kempsey <laughs> and all of this sort of stuff, and sit in the regional halls. So spot on, so spot on. It was scary, and I was in a cafe reading the book, um, and I was laughing out loud and quite <laughs> embarrassed. The other one is. Um, because you currently live in the northern northern, northern rivers, northern, northern rivers area, yeah. Mm. So um, I grew up in Coffs Harbour myself. Okay. My mum currently lives in Pottsville, which is around yeah, the Mullumbimby yeah, yeah. area. I know. Um, and your your snapshot of that area of Mullumbimby and mm. the <laughs> the interesting spiritual practices and you know some of the hypocritical tendencies I guess some of them have was for me. So delightful. <laughs> um, yeah, is that something that you find yourself? Because I guess living there, do you interact well, well, with that sort uh, of stuff? There's, let's just say there's heaps of material. Mm. There's, mm. He, there's heaps of material there. And, and I, I love the area. And there's people of all sorts. I mean, there's, there's stayed um, old farming families, uh, mm. you know, quite conservative people who... Um, and there's, and, you know, there's, there's leftover hippies and there's, there's, young, you know, there's young people there's, at the surface you know, and things. And there's a bit of everything. And that's what I find um, in, in a in a rather luxurious landscape full of things that can bite you and so forth. Um, but so it's just, it's just nice to like, nice to write about. Um, but I do feel fond of it, uh, but, it's, but it's still worth taking the piss where it's necessary. Yeah, I feel the same. That's exactly my feeling towards that area as well is it is absolutely gorgeous and the people are very friendly. Mm. But yeah, it's definitely worth taking, <laughs> taking the piss out of it. I think most Australian hometowns are worth taking the piss out of it at some point. If you take it too seriously, it gets a bit, yeah. gets a bit mm. silly. Um, I do want to jump briefly to Our Sunshine mm-hmm. because for those of you that haven't read it, you need to immediately pick it up and read it. Um, it it's Whenever I explain it to someone, I always call it fact fiction um, Ned Kelly story mm. because to me that's what it is because I, I have a, a huge interest in uh, Ned Kelly, as you can probably tell from the beard. Um, I, and reading it, I, it, I was like, how could you possibly take all these m- moments in history? Because we don't have a full picture of his life. We have moments of his we life. We don't have a picture at all, really. Well, we, yeah. Which is what attracted me to the idea. And, and you and you go from that, and yet, again, you know, a couple of hundred pages in a book, and you tie these moments that we that we think we know about together, and it's so realistic. And again, you get into this character, and, and I guess it's even more so with him because... There's not really anything for you to base it on in a way, like you know. There's no mm-hmm. bush ranger to walk around to. So I guess, how did you how did you come? I guess how did you come across the Ned Kelly idea, and how did you even get into being able to do that? Does it make it easier because, in terms of as a writer, because there's not as much? Well, I thought it was going to make it difficult, but um, it in fact did make it better. It, it was interesting uh, in that how I came. I was in in the um, 
a New South Wales State Library looking up something else. Mm. And I, I suddenly um, thought of a, uh, uh, who would be, I think there'd be an article in the paper the day before about a, the fam- uh, 10 famous Australians or something. It was always, you know, Don Bradman, uh, Dawn Fraser, Farlap, you know, the usual things. Mm, yeah. And Ned, Ned's name was there. But I mean, I thought, um, what, do, what do we really know about him? And I asked for. I looked up his files, and there's more on him than on any other any other Australian before or since. Mm. But it's all either pro police stuff, saying he was you know he was sort of virtually you know the devil incarnate, mm. or very very sentimental Irish stuff, saying he's he's you know God's angel sort of thing, the best yeah. person that ever lived, uh, you know Robin Hood and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So I thought, well, what's he really like? And while the um, the library uh, helpers were bringing up stuff from downstairs. I just picked up a random book from the shelves. This is a, a big library with thousands and thousands of copies. And it was a book by the Victorian photographer, um, John William Lint, uh, who was a 19th century uh, photographer. And um, the book did that thing that they do in bad novels. It fell open at a certain page. Okay. <laughs> and, and it was a picture of uh, a photograph taken of Joe Byrne, who was Ned's offsider, yep. being strung up on the wall of the Benalla Jail mm. in, in, a, in a position uh, simulating life while v- photographers and police stood around and pressmen at the time stood around laughing at this, at this body being strung up and being photographed like, he, like Joe was actually uh, pointing a gun at him but his head was down, his arm was down. Things. Mm. And I found it macabre and, mm. and cruel. Mm. Yeah, um, and at that moment... Uh, a thing happened, uh, and that sounds a bit crazy, but I had that feeling in the back of your neck where, um, you know, the hairs rise in the back of your mm. neck and you feel the thing. And I thought, this is, so- this is something, this is something. And I wanted to, r- I wanted to write it. And uh, I wanted to write the story of the Kelly Gang and, and Ned. And um, all, that, all that was available was, all, that, all I wanted to deal with was actual, um, like a, um, a calendar of events, uh, what happened. You know, that's just the bare bones, like three pages of what happened on certain dates. So I would get that right. Mm-hmm. And then um, I'd make up, because there was nothing on, on what he was like as a man. There's nothing like on whether he had a girlfriend. There's nothing on anything, really. Yeah. And so I, that gave me complete freedom to, um, to make it up. And uh, I used things in it that I thought um, stood out a little bit more than, uh, well, a lot more, like his love for his mother, because uh, when he started getting into trouble, he was defending her and his, and his sister. He was defending them against crooked cops and things. Mm. Um, and I sort of went on from there. And his friendship, his mateship with, um, with Joe Byrne, and he's and his looking after his young brother Dan and that sort of thing. And then I thought of, well, how old were these guys? And even though Ned had, uh, you know, a full beard, yeah. Um, at the end, he was still only twenty four then. Yeah, yeah. So, so at the time when they, they were rampant, uh, he was like nineteen, and yeah. the others, Joe, Joe, and, and and the others were a little bit younger, and um, and his brothers and, uh, and Steve Hart were younger still. So they're really like a gang of bikies or something, really. Or I'm trying to think of a contemporary counterpart, but they weren't these mature, um, you know, desperados. No, they, yeah. they were yeah, they were young young men. Yeah, um, or you know, youths. And I found that sort of interesting. It made it easier, uh, a bit easier to write about. And I loved writing it. And, and all the way through it, I had the feeling that, um, oh, this, this will sound a bit crazy, but I had a feeling that I was, I was part of it. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, okay. Um, that I was, I was actually part of the story. Uh, and, uh, and I don't usually get that. I'm, I'm usually the observer or the, in, the interpreter or whatever. Yeah. But I felt that I was part of the story. And, and uh, like, as you, said, you loved writing it, I loved reading it. And I think as, as a reader... I, you know, I feel like I'm part of it, and sometimes I feel like I don't know if I'm remembering fact or if I'm remembering our <laughs> yeah. sunshine mm. because mm. it's all it it, it all fits. Mm. Yeah, kind of along the lines you were talking about these guys being so young. I think you really capture it well in some of the decisions that Ned makes throughout the books, or even spur of the moment sort of situations, like uh, when they're out in the bush and the troopers come, and he kind of just just offhandedly kind of snaps and just shoots one of them and then that's the beginning of mm. everything like that's the mm. beginning of the end and then mm. the killing do you know what I mean? do you know what i mean like they were they weren't these yeah like you mentioned they weren't these manly desperados these were kids mm. who were trying to do the right thing and kind of hiding out because they had done the wrong thing and then in a moment mm. these sorts of situations well they occurred. were they were fired upon uh, and the, and the shots missed but the, but he was a good shot and he fired back and and, yeah. got, and got them um but i like the um well, I mean, it's everyone. Does. It's it's why he's the. It's why still today, you can see um, Ned Kelly gentleman's tailoring in country towns and Ned yeah. Kelly bread and that yeah. sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of, sort of he's a he's a, a figure of uh, representing other things. You know. Yeah. Uh, 
he should be on one of our coins or one of our <laughs> notes or something like he's that well, important be more accurate if he's on one of our notes yeah. well true. <laughs> yeah. Every, every, yeah everyone knows but uh i guess we'll we'll we'll, we'll we could sit and talk for hours because this is it's it's so great to sit and talk to you and meet you after reading your work and absolutely um, and such amazing work and as i said it, it paints australia so so brilliant if you live in australia you, you have to read these books because you'll just sit there and, and you'll just have a whole bunch of moments where you go oh yeah that's steve-o down the road and that's yeah. dave and that's you'll see your family and everyone you know in there absolutely yeah. mm-hmm. and but, uh, yeah for overseas as well exactly yeah. yeah it's a perfect perfect picture in that it paints the positives and it paints the not, not so, so not so great favorable things yeah. um which is how you should be presenting things i think there's no yeah. point you know, and if, and if you're an Australian, really, you have to. Uh, well, I, I feel you've got to actually um, present things in a way that's a bit comic, because it's a mm. it's a pretty we're a pretty comical sort of people. Though. We are, <laughs> yeah, and uh, absolutely are. That definitely leads me into our last question. So, no matter who we talk to or how serious we talk, we always have one question that we have to ask everyone that we interview that is less serious. Although we've asked so many people, and the answers have varied, but also gotten people very amped up and agitated and. Everyone has a very strong opinion. Absolutely. Now, it's, it's, it could be a hard one for you. It might require some memory. I'm not sure. But um, when you had more hair, how did you wash it is the question. Do you have a particular method? Was it double shampoo, <laughs> single shampoo, conditioner? I don't even know. It's been so long, I can't even remember <laughs> it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, fun- it's funny. If you, um, I was, I was an, earlier, an early cut it all short person mm, okay. uh, I, I never had the comb over or, yeah. or the Prince Charles that I gave um, <laughs> yeah, here, here yeah. in the book yeah, yeah the, uh, the, the, the fancy the, the haircut that was popular back then and it's popular again now with the <laughs> hipsters and everything it's, um, it's a great question I love that question, question because well, we'll, we'll just take everyone. your answer as you don't Let's just I look. don't now but I used <laughs> yeah. to use a daughter, whichever shampoo um, my daughters or wife had in the, in the shower says I guess well, I, probably, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't even know the names of it. It's probably a very good treatment you were getting then, if you're trusting their <laughs> judgment. It's probably some great stuff, some Perfect. color treatment or that. But yeah. uh, all right, well let's uh, we'll wrap this up. You've had a big day, and we thank you so much for talking to us about uh, your, mm. your novel uh, Whip Bird once again. Please, everyone, go out and buy this. I cannot state this enough. This is actually I loved this book mm. i was going to swear then i held it back i'm being polite because <laughs> we've got a guest, on, oh, a guest, got a guest on the show yeah no it, it was fucking fantastic um to to use my french um so yeah thank you so much for coming on robert we thanks, really appreciate thanks guys it. i appreciate it thank you very much amazing what an interview what an interview don't want to toot our own horns but hong kong yeah <laughs> Stop tooting. Ew, yeah. It's so gross. So good. I could have sat and talked with Robert Drew for like hours. I want to just grab a beer or a wine and just hang out with him. Yeah, I know. I was really conscious of the time, especially because towards the end, we could see Enya's, the um, the penguin publicist lady, kind of looking through the window. I was like, <laughs> okay, we've got to wrap this up. We've got to wrap this up. But yeah, absolutely. I could have kept talking to Robert for so long. He is a very interesting man and an extremely talented writer. As we said, if you haven't... Um, read his work before, please go read it. I'm a big fan of Our Sunshine, but definitely pick up uh, Whip Bird from either the Penguin website or whatever reputable bookshop you go to. If you can find a copy of it, you were looking at uh, a couple of online bookshops. I and was. And it's, they were out of stock. It's bloody sold out. It's, yeah. it's, everyone's just been like, yep, got to get it. They heard they heard that we were doing an interview with him. They just thought we had to get it. If the boys, yeah. if the boys like it. It's purely get it. based. It would be completely based on us, yeah. I would say. No yeah. other way. But um, yeah, no, it is It is actually sold out. But you can you know, you can buy electronic copies as well if you're into that kind yeah. of Yeah, I saw a couple of copies left. There was like only three copies, I think, at the bookshop that I was in the other day. Mm. But um, they had a couple of copies so you can still find it and if you can get it read it yeah <laughs> sorry i like burped <laughs> I was waiting your voice halfway was. through it wasn't a dramatic pause um so yeah thank you so much robert drew for taking time to talk to people that are 50 years younger than you yeah absolutely um, it was an awesome conversation it was he's now the wisest is the nice way of putting it he's the oldest man we've ever had oldest person we've ever had on the podcast by mm. a significant number yeah um but, but he's he definitely was, the wisest he's definitely wise and he was gr- he was yeah it was just great to have a chat with it's nice to have an intelligent conversation on this bloody podcast for once mate. bloody intellectuals we is um mm. thank you so much to Agnes from penguin for organizing this one for us again and sending us a book yeah um, she treats us real good treats she us does. right always a pleasure um and thank you penguin melbourne for having us in your 
office and not kicking us out. Um, and you know that was nice. It was really it's a really nice office as well. It was, so it was gorgeous, we've been yeah. we've been in we've been in there before. You know we've, <laughs> yeah. we've got a room. Uh, We're big wigs. We are. We have big wigs. Um, but yeah, so thank you to everyone that organised it and, and was involved. And, and yeah, especially big thank you for Robert for actually just being like, yeah, I'll talk to these. Excuse me, no, I but these two uh, these two boys, young whippersnappers, these lads. Yeah, absolutely. Fun uh, times. It was we'll make this. Uh, we're hoping to make this sort of a regular thing as well. Give you the heads up as the it old, were. The old radical um, reading corner. Yeah, radical yeah. reading corner is yeah. what we've decided to call it. We want to uh, get some Australian authors on, get some Australian work on. Penguin, um, please employ us. Yeah, that? spread the word about some of our fantastic writers. Robert mentioned it in our interview, but uh, you know the word's not out there enough, and we've got some killer writers here in Australia. So yeah, got to share it. We've got to have the platform for us, Penguin, please employ us. I keep hearing this weird sound. I can't work out what it is. <laughs> yeah, um, you keep saying that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so as always, thank you to uh, Taylor Smell T, Smell Smelly T for our cover art. It's amazing. And we had some compliments on it this week. So you <laughs> toot did. your own horn, Taylor. Mm. Um, yes. Yeah, you, do you want to turn? Yeah. It's your turn now. Yeah. And uh, of course, thank you to Curtis Fernandes, Fern Tree Music. You can follow him on Facebook as well. Mm. T- t- just fern tree music i think yep um yeah thank you for uh, your in- introduction our introduction work we're not using anything else on this particular podcast not on this he, one the interview was too good to take yeah he supplies us with yeah. the great music um that we need for everything that we ever do all so our music's ever he's a-okay with me uh make sure that you share this around with your friends share it on facebook share it on twitter share it on instagram send an email put it on a uh, usb and shove it in someone's computer put it on a cd if you've still got those put it just... on a floppy disk and yeah. leave it in <laughs> a strange location because if it's on a floppy disk someone's definitely going to pick it up because i think they're quite valuable now well yeah because you look at them and you go you know what? I've got a floppy disk drive somewhere. I wonder what's on this. And it's like, put some Pac-Man on there too. Yeah. If you can find the space on the two <laughs> megabytes of room, yeah. you'll get like the introduction of our song just going, in a world, and then that's it. That's the whole thing, yeah. Um. So yeah, do that. Rate and review us on iTunes and wherever and else you can of, yeah. rate and review us. Do all of, all of those things. Um. Send us emails and do all those things. You know where it, you know, you know where it is. www.yegaday.com That's the one. Um, and quick personal plugs. We both have shows coming up in the 2017 Melbourne Fringe Festival. We do. We do. So uh, if you are in Melbourne, are yep. going to be in Melbourne. Or know someone in Melbourne. Uh, yeah, come along. Yeah. My show is running from the 16th to the 23rd. Jim with a T, tribute show to Jim Henson at the Metropolitan Hotel. Yes. Um, and Leon, you do your little plug now. I was going to, but then you kept talking. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, so my show, Talk Show with Myself, is on the 25th and 26th of uh, September. Three shows there at Hair Hole, which is the Hairs and Hyena bookshop in Fitzroy. Uh, but it'd be great. It's a real steal. $15 for a full price, $10 for a concession. So <laughs> you can't afford not to buy it. It's good and stuff. I can't afford not to have you to come. Yeah. <laughs> we need the audience members. But yeah. You can buy tickets to both of the shows at uh, www.melbournefringe.com.au. Is it? it's in Australia. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Well, good for them. And you just um, search, out, search the name of the show. Yeah, it's re- re- real simple like. Um, so yeah, great. We, uh, Tim and I both had a great episode. Um, as you know, Tim doesn't like listening to the sound of his own voice, but I sent him the file of the interview and said, Tim, you actually have to listen to this one. And I did. Um, I listened to the entire interview because I actually really enjoyed it. We came out of there feeling really, really good and really happy. And we just were, yeah, on top of the world. Um, mm. but yeah, so th- as I said, thanks to everyone, uh, Robert and yours, Penguin, you guys are great. We love you. Please keep doing things with us. Um, and thank you everyone for listening because without you, we'd be dead. Um, mm. Would we? I don't know. How will we ever know? Science. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> I think that's it. Anything else, Tim? I think that's the whole kit and capoodle. Capoodle. I think that's how you pronounce it. Possibly. I. Well, as always. As every day. Yeah. Good day, Tim. Yep. Good day, Leon. Yeah. Good day, everyone. Yeah. Good day, everyone. Catch you on the flippity flop. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.